Hello, listener. Welcome to podcast 202. And after the frivolity of the last couple of episodes, <laughs> you've only got the uh, specific pleasure of Farmer Phil and I this week because Heather's uh, got I'm not entirely sure where has she gone, Phil? She's gone to do something with leaves this morning. Okay. While the cat's away and all that, I say. I see. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, Heather's left us a load of instructions, uh, most of which we'll, we'll do our best to ignore. Um, but <laughs> but we had some, We've had some feedback from various sources over the last couple of weeks. Now, the first bit of feedback is from a gentleman called Ken Bolton. I know I've spoken to, uh, to Ken before on numerous occasions. Ken's had the decency to uh, give us some input on our many efforts of podcasting. And it's interesting what he says. And Phil, he seems to have taken umbrage with some of the remarks you made you, about those buzzards. I do know. seem to have annoyed him, don't I? You do, you do. Um, would you like me to read this out? Yeah, yeah so fire away. Um, benefits, like, so I shoot this across. Ken has written to me uh, specifically, but obviously he copied in Phil and Hev in the process. But he says, Hi, Richard. I've listened to all the podcasts and find them usually informative and funny. However, Farmer Phil's comments on buzzards were neither. Farmer Phil sounded more like a Victorian landowner slash gamekeeper who was responsible for almost wiping out many of the uh, birds of prey or anything with a hooked beak. He is correct when he says that buzzards are a common sight in today's skies. But just because he's got several following his tractor stuffing their faces on worms, that's possibly pointing to the fact that there's a shortage of other food available, he is utterly incorrect. Ken goes on to say, a large proportion of a buzzard's diet is made up of worms and other insects, but also frogs and toads, of course. Being a lazy bird with very small feet, these are Ken's words, uh, in brackets, talons, uh, in comparison to its size, it would rather feed on carrion, road kills in brackets, than chase and kill prey itself. Uh, That's one point. Uh, Then Ken remarks, Heather, I think some of the, the raptors that you saw on the M4 more likely be hen pheasants and not buzzards. You often see these birds sat on telephone poles at the sides of roads. Buzzards, that is. Even in today's world, birds of prey are still under threat from farmers and landowners, with eagles in Scotland and red kites in the West Country being shot and poisoned this year. Interestingly, I spoke to someone the other day who said they had a red kite with them for ages, eating mice and voles from a a wildflower meadow that they'd cut back in the summer we had time. one round round just round here, here yeah just day. dorston you know yeah. just, i've seen one round here but they've got huge areas that they cover don't they so they have. the same one they have i know you're absolutely right it, they do seem to be encroaching territory today anyway ken goes on to say birds of prey are at the top of the food chain and an indicator that there is a good natural balance of food prey in brackets built up under them i for one would love to see the buzzard back in our skies and long may it continue but this will only happen if people are given the facts and not biased opinions. And he ends his note here. But you know what they say about a little knowledge, don't you? Farmer Phil. Well, um, I have to say that I think that Ken has probably <laughs> misunderstood me to some degree or I have um, misrepresented myself because there are few people more keen on birds of prey on and around the farm than myself. So... I have no wish to slaughter buzzards and I think really that the situation we have today is as a direct result of many fewer birds of prey being harmed by those aforementioned Victorian landowners and gamekeepers. My comments about buzzards following the plough are a relative thing that year on year the numbers are going up rapidly and it's not just on this farm that countrywide it is, as he says, correct to say there are many more of them. Yeah. My point is that some years ago you had many fewer buzzards following the plough and they didn't tend to eat worms at the rate that they do now. The fact that they eat so many now suggests to me that they're not going after other things. And I know they do go after other things because I see them catching leverets, I see them catching chicks if they can, they'll get ground you know, chicks on the ground of, of ground nesting birds, they will catch them because, as he rightly says, they're easy prey to a mm-hmm. buzzard, no problem at all. My point is this, that they are at the top of the food chain and they are, because there's plenty of food for them, getting very numerous. What is going to restrict their numbers 
and how much damage are their numbers going to do to other less competitive species who feed on similar things. And I don't believe that I am incorrect in suggesting as I do what a buzzard's feeding habits are because I watch them doing it every day. I live amongst them. It's an they will thing, catch it? rabbits. They, they, will. They, they, they do. I mean, they, they are, but as Ken suggests, they are they're real um, uh, opportunists. I think the ideal solution would be to have a few uh, European eagle owls flying <laughs> around because they, they, they love feasting on buzzards, you know. But that, you, that's the There was a program, wasn't there, a while ago? There was a pair, up in, a pair of European eagle owls. I mean, unfortunately, I think they were, were killed by some farmer, but they were visiting every year, and they have done for, for a long time, you know, because they're, they're long-lived birds. And they found a whole loads of buzzard remains uh, mm. around the area that the, the eagle owls were living in. So, again, fantastic sort of natural I think, really, to... the point I'm trying to make is that man's activities, whether they are in providing food as roadkill yeah. or providing food from agricultural operations, are leading to a very successful population of buzzards. And I don't think that that is necessarily a good thing. I don't have a solution to it, and I'm not suggesting that we should all go out shooting buzzards. Well, but they have no predators. It's cyclical. I mean, it, this it tends to happen that the population density of a certain animal g- gets to the extent where it can it can no longer be supported by the natural foodstuffs around it, and then obviously there's a dramatic decline in population. Mm. Now that happens with everything. I mean, the reason why. Elephants, for instance, are culled in, in Africa and sometimes in a pretty awfully dramatic fashion is because they, what they will do is eat everything that's around them, destroy everything, and then all those herds will die a fairly mm. dramatic and, uh, and protracted death through starvation. So they cull them, you know, and that's, uh, that's pretty much what tends to happen. Now, I don't think, you know, a cull of buzzards will ever happen. And, no. I, and I'm sure, and I'm saying that it's very much the last thing that anybody would, would want. But what I would hope is that there will be sufficient environment and habitat to support the species that the buzzards are feeding on now, so that if it does get to the extent where buzzard populations are dramatic and they do affect the populations of of everything else, the population of buzzards dramatically declines, collapses, then the prey stuff that they fed on to the point that it's demise will have opportunities to suddenly expound and, uh, and increase their numbers again. And consequently, buzzards' numbers then will grow again. So, I mean, that's a natural process, you know. But what's it, so that's important for us as land managers to be aware of is that we provide those opportunities so those, the prey creatures and the buzzards can, you know, their numbers can go up and down naturally over the decades. I, I think you're right. That is the ideal. But we're about to talk about foxes. And, you know, there you have the same thing, that man's activity provides food for a species to mm. the point that we have to control yeah. that species because nothing else is going to. You know, I absolutely agree with Ken that poisoning birds of prey is not on. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't happen here. And I'm, he's dead right that, you know, the eagles in Scotland and the red kites shouldn't be poisoned. But having said that, I'm not convinced that he's right that they may not need managing in some instances and that is a difficult subject we've always shied away from the fact that in the past gamekeepers control birds of prey okay and that is a fact it is something that happened and he's right that some of them tried to wipe them out but it wasn't me and it won't be me when uh, when I was uh, when I was much much younger, you know, I, I, I mentioned before the fact that I, I worked on um, fish farms and the like, and of course, uh, pest control was was a, a factor. We used to have to keep the rats down and the mink and things like that, and we did as young men try on on various occasions to keep foxes down that kept coming and licking the chickens <laughs> uh, without success. And I remember a couple of nights, you know, going out there and pretending to to imitate a, an injured rabbit, you know, to try and get the fox close, but it never worked because uh, our imitations were a bit shocking. I mean, I know you can get little devices that mimic the sounds of prey animals, but we didn't have the luxury of those things. But you've got a chap on your pussy. You, I see rattling around the farm. I have done for, I've had a few interesting conversations with him over the years. But he's a bit of a dab hand, isn't he? The you know, art of fo- so-called squeaking rabbits, a fox is a fairly black art in as much as many people try and do it and very few can do it effectively. And essentially what you're trying to do is to attract the fox's attention and draw him towards you until you can get a clean shot at him. Therefore, being effective at it means that you get a good clean shot so that you're not injuring foxes and half shooting them and all the rest of it. It's effective fox control and everything works well. 
but actually to be able to make the noise well enough so that the fox turns and comes towards you is a very clever thing. And we've got a recording, I think, of pussy squeaking so that you can make your own judgment. So anyway, have a listen. I need somebody, I need a sound effect of, for my podcast. Because we said some people can do it so that a fox comes, can't they? Yeah. And you can, and we said that, so I want to record you doing it. Where is he, Is it going to be loud? Not that loud. OK, here is Pussy with his impression of a rabbit. Do you know what's happened, Puss? A fox has come. <laughs> that was pretty effective, pretty judging by, judging by the say, reaction of the dogs. Yeah, yeah, no, because it isn't worth it. They would sat there quietly and they it's pricked up and they looked across to, to Michael who played the recording. That was fabulous. It was, I mean, that was very convincing and something that I find very difficult to achieve. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I went down a few weeks ago, I did a talk just outside of, of Abergavenny. And as the, the, uh, the guys that were coming in to listen to the talk sort of shuffled through and were finding their seats, you know, they were all chatting uh, to one another. And I just, I was doing a bit of eavesdropping and, and one of, the, uh, one of the, the, the women in there, very pleasant, was talking about the fact that they just had a, a TB test. Yep. And she was really worried because it would seem that their tests were coming back uh, negative. And, and, you know, she was uh, being um, consoled almost by some mm. of her friends, you know, that were in the, uh, that were in the audience. Uh, you've just had one, haven't you? Just yeah, we, we were testing last week. A lot of farmers regard it as worse than foot and mouth because it is a complete lottery. Yeah. You know, you just don't know what's going to happen. Essentially, we're legally obliged to test our cattle once a year. We're in an area of the country where TB is rife and getting worse. It is widely accepted that there is a reservoir of TB in the badger population and therefore, until that is addressed, they will keep giving TB back to the cattle. So for us, an animal that comes back negative from a TB test or, or positive, if you like, test positive for TB is compulsory, compulsorily purchased and if you have a significant number within your herd they can take the whole lot. Right. You get financial compensation, it's yeah. not a dead loss, no. but that's not compensation really for the restrictions that go with having TB. You can't sell cattle, you can't buy cattle and financially it can be disastrous. So anyway, here's our efforts last week. Keith Powell, the vet, came and tested the cattle. You test them one day and then read the test three days later. Kettle's just boiled. It's Tuesday morning, 27th of October, 2009. I'm in the kitchen with Farmer Phil and Sam. Hello, both. Hello. Good morning. And it is TB testing day. How many times have you tested these cattle for TB? Well, we've tested for TB ever since I was a child. I can't rem- I don't actually remember when we first started testing for TB. We've always done it. So what's the problem? Because you're always moaning about it and you're always saying it's a lottery and you're always saying that they're being handled more than usual. Well, essentially, the testing for TB is essential because with TB in the UK cattle herd, you have to try and get rid of it. But the reason that it's a lottery is that the rules of our government are such that it's, we only do half a job so that we keep testing and slaughtering the cattle, but we're not doing anything about the body of disease that is within their environment. And the problem with that is that for us who are clear of TB, essentially, we each year run the risk of, uh, the phrase is going down with TB, so finding animal or animals with TB, which will then shut us down, which means that we can't move stock onto or off the premises without going through a load of rigmarole and trouble. So what will happen today? Today we will inoculate the cattle with a TB serum, which is based on avian TB, and essentially what we do is put a a little shot of it in skin on the neck of the cow in two places, two different serums, and then in three days' time we'll measure the skin reaction. Do you ever do that in humans? Is there anything similar in humans? Not That's not like the MMR vaccine, is it, or anything? No, this is not a vaccine, although it works in a similar way. It's, It's by putting something in that stimulates the TB response in the cow. 
And if the cow has either got TB or seen TB, you'll get a much bigger response than if it hasn't. So if you're going to gather up all the cattle and you're going to get the vet here to put them all through the crush and you're going to individually inspect them and give them individually a jab and then you're going to bring them back and check the skin reaction to see if there's any individual problems, why the hell don't you just vaccinate the cow? There isn't a vaccine for TB. Why? Because, I mean, there's a vaccine. I was offered a swine flu vaccine the problem, yesterday. The problem is that the only vaccines that they've managed to come up with are only about 70 or 80% effective. Well, the that's ru- a good... Well, you might think so, but the rules of the EEC are that once you vaccinate your herd, you're then not treated as disease-free because you can't then test a vaccinated cow. And once you're not TB or disease-free, you lose that status then you can't export any beef to Europe. So, if you were looking at purely the welfare of the cattle, you would vaccinate them and supply locally? No, if I was looking purely at the welfare of the cattle, I would address the disease as a whole, and I would carry on testing the cattle, and I would supply them locally, so that, I mean, that's, that's a different argument, in my view, that supply of meat locally is a good thing, notwithstanding TB. The issues with TB are that we're needlessly slaughtering cattle because we're not addressing the disease as a whole. What do you mean needlessly slaughtering cattle? Because the cattle will be slaughtered anyway and go for meat. Absolutely, but you, the taxpayer, are paying to slaughter them and we're suffering the trauma of having cattle slaughtered. We don't want to slaughter our breeding cows. They're not going to go for meat or our bulls or or that sort of animal. And if you don't address the other half of the equation, which is the reservoir of TB in wild animals, notably badgers here, then you're never going to get rid of it. But the argument would be, it's all very well saying that you should deal with the badgers, but first of all, they're not the original source of the problem. No, hindsight's a marvellous thing, and knowing what we know now, things might have been different. But the fact of the matter is that the badgers did get TB from the cattle originally, and the badgers now have got TB. For the welfare of the badgers, the TB has to be controlled and cured in the badgers because TB will kill a badger just as well as it'll kill anything else. The problem occurred when we had the foot and mouth outbreak in 2000, 2001. Because of the risks of spreading foot and mouth, everybody stopped testing for TB and they lost control of it so that they then had TB in the cattle again and the cattle were giving it back to the badgers again so that the the whole thing got out of control and they can't get it back. It always seems to be cattle, you know. Well, TB, should we just give up bovine, breeding beef cattle? No, bovine TB is obviously from its name a disease of cattle. It doesn't affect sheep or pigs or anything else. But the point is, it's a management issue and for the benefit of the wildlife as much as for the benefit of the cattle and the sheer unadulterated cost of it, we ought to put it right. If we stopped having cattle, well, great, you wouldn't have any beef. Actually, what you'd do is import it from some other part of the world. But your landscape would change markedly because it wouldn't look like it is. The badgers would still have TB so that they'd be running around ill and horrible. There is some suggestion that cats can actually catch bovine TB. It's rare, but apparently there is scope for that. As the disease pressure builds, then something else will succumb. My mystery is if all these badgers are going around with TB, you know how awful this is and how contagious it is and gosh this is a dreadful thing why do you last week tell me that there's no natural predator to a badger and the badgers are taking over the place and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more than there was previously if there's this disease that should be wiping them out left, right and centre. That actually is part and parcel of the problem because the overpopulation of the badgers has put them under stress for food and space and that has made them more susceptible to catching TB from each other or from diseased cattle. But they don't get wiped out so why don't they wipe themselves out with TB? They won't wipe them out but what will happen is that it just causes large numbers of them to die a slow and horrendous death. It's not a disease that just wipes out populations it didn't wipe out the human race when we suffered from it in victorian times it did lead to large numbers of us getting shut up in sheds on the top of moors and mountains in an effort to cure us so 
Do all farmers carry out this test? It is a legal obligation for all keepers of cattle to carry out regular TB testing. The interval at which you test depends on the perceived likelihood of you getting TB. So here we're in a TB hotspot, so we're, uh, depending on exactly where you are and what your TB history is, you're on six-month or 12-month testing. It can be as long a part as four-year testing if you're in a low-risk area. Is that a matter of trust, or is there somebody checking no, out that you're DEFRA, TB? DEFRA tell you when you're due a TB test, and if you don't carry it out by the date, you are not allowed to move any animals legally until you've carried out a clear TB test. When you say allowed to move any animals legally, do you mean that you could kill them on the farm and then sell them? You can send animals to the abattoir, direct to the abattoir, not via a market, from a farm that has TB. That is the one release point, if you like, that you can have TB, can't get clear of it, but you can still send animals to kill because there is no risk to human health by sending an animal with TB to a slaughterhouse. What you can't do is move an animal farm to farm. So if I was a less, if I wasn't a farmer, Phil, and I'd got um, a few cattle and I didn't have the TB test, I could still legally sell those cattle to eat. You can, but DEFRA would be on to you because they do not like farms going untested. So that although you are allowed to send cattle from a closed-down farm to slaughter, they would keep on at you every month, and in the end they would say, you can't even do that we want to come and test you and broadly speaking that's quite a good idea because usually the few farms that fall into that category are committing another raft of heinous crimes in terms of welfare and how they operate they've you know for whatever reason nowhere near the standards required so that usually you'll find that they've got tagging problems and identification problems you know it may be that somebody's not very well or they've got too old or they can't bring themselves to do it or whatever but they're very few but that's the most likely scenario you don't get away with trying to be a proper farmer and not abide by the rules because they will catch up with you in the end if dear listener you're hearing some snorting and some sniffing it's not sam is it sam no fully recovered yeah it is actually jam and i think either there's a mace in the haste again like last week or a few weeks ago on the podcast or sam's cat has made a smell on her leg and jam is sniffing about it but that sniff is actually toast so this test is welcome on the farm. It's not welcomed. So it's not exactly welcomed, but it is necessary. But the problem is that there's an elephant in the room. There is an elephant in the room. And it's a badger. And in our case, it's a badger. But the real elephant in the room are the politicians because they refuse to address the situation. And in our case, we've got cattle in Wales and cattle in England in, in Wales the head vet there has said we're going to sort out the badgers and in England we have this prevarication and frankly weak useless activity from the government they're talking about vaccination that's two three years in the making it's costly it'll have an effect but it'll be marginal and really Every time the, the farmers say, well, look, this is ridiculous, they say, oh, well, it's European legislation and so on. It's nothing of the sort because Wales have said, stuff that, we're going to do what we think we want to do. <coughs> Excuse me. And really, it is a case of looking at the problem, solving it for the benefit of the livestock, the badgers and the taxpayer because it costs the taxpayer millions and millions of pounds at the moment, needlessly wasted. Do you know what I think? I'm sure you're going to tell me. I am. I think it is totally disrespectful to individuals. I think it's disrespectful to the Wiggly podcast listeners because the reason that this problem isn't being addressed is the normal rubbish. It's spin and hype. And because these days you don't trust politicians and you don't trust the way that it is, they have not got the trust of people to make decisions that are based on 
We're doing this for the best reasons. And I believe that if Wiggly Podcast listeners are listening now, they will fully understand the reasons that the problem has to be addressed with the badgers. And it's not because farmers want to wipe out badgers or badgers are evil. It's because the badgers are poorly and therefore deserve respect as well. In a nutshell. There we are. This was a party political broadcast on behalf of the Wiggly Party, the monster raving Wiggly Party. Just before you go, Farmer Phil, a little bone to pick with you. How have I ended up on the Farmer's Weekly website as a sexy farmer? (laughs) Why have I got no comments about being a sexy farmer and I've had 1,400 views and a three-star? Three stars? Yes. Oh. And that's a very bad review. <laughs> <laughs> it means I'm not the UK's sexiest farmer. I've loved lots of views, but no one has voted for me. And I've had one thing saying I'm a three star. And there's a lady, a beautiful young looking lady, who's got a five star next to me. Couldn't possibly explain. You've been putting me up on websites. Why would I do that? Anyway, could you take the recorder with you to the vet and as he inoculates the cattle, can you explain exactly what he's doing then? We will have a go. Why's that? So here we are, TB testing. So I'm with Keith the vet, who is right as we speak. So you've marked two places on her neck by clipping the hair and you're now going to inoculate those two places with... Uh, avian bovine. And the idea is... Uh, we're trying to identify if this animal uh, has or the carrier of uh, bovine tuberculosis, um, which is quite a serious zoonotic disease. That's a disease which can be transmitted from animals to humans. Um, it's the reason we pasteurise milk. Uh, it's to prevent human uh, infection. I've actually seen humans with it, and it's quite a nasty disease. Um, kids often get it from drinking milk. They get these big hard lumps in their throats. Um, which have to be surgically removed, ultimately. This presumably wasn't in this country. That wasn't in this country. <laughs> now, yeah. this, you can't really refer to this cow as just this cow, because this is Abigail, so named because as a calf she was a pain in the ass and was named after her owner's niece. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> and How old so you? she's probably six or seven now. Um, and so having inoculated the, the, the skin, effectively with avian and bovine TB, in three days' time, you'll come and have another look to see what the reaction has been then. Uh, that's correct, yeah. We're, we're looking for lumps in the skin, basically. Uh, we've actually injected in the skin, not under the skin, within the skin, and we're looking for a change in skin thickness um, between now and Thursday. We inject with two types of tuberculin because the disease we're worried about is bovine tuberculosis. Stupid question, but if you inject her with bovine TB, why doesn't she catch it? Uh, it's not the actual bacteria we're injecting. It's, so just, it's, a, a, it's just part of the, the shell of the bacteria. So, so it, it's in a shape that her she immune system... She thinks it's... Her, her immune system will think that it's right. part of that bacteria, yeah. Precisely. And so, assuming that she doesn't react, and that the, particularly the bottom lump, the bovine the lump... The bottom lump is the one we're looking is, for. ...is not a large lump, then she will go clear mm. and she hasn't got TB and we can carry on. Yes, so Fingers that's crossed. good. Fingers crossed for Friday, Abigail. For Abigail, yeah. So here we are, the post TB test cup of coffee. Keith, what's the result? Uh, I'm very pleased to say you passed with flying colours. Which is actually quite quite a good thing from my point of view because it's very often when we come to this point we've got sort of what are, what are partial reactions, what are classed as inconclusive reactors, and we have to retest those, and they're sort of neither one thing nor the other. It was a very nice, very clear test. We're in an area with a high incidence of tuberculosis, bovine tuberculosis, and this farm has gone clear. You look at the, all sorts of different factors as to why that is, and this isn't an intensive farm. The animals sort of live in natural groups. They're not stressed metabolically. They're not stressed in any way, really. You often see farms like this, uh, which go clear, which is surrounded by more intensive holdings. So I think the stress on the animal definitely plays a part in it. Well, that's good news that we've passed. That's 12 months. We can now 
Pass really nicely. Hardly we any can lumps. move the calves to their next home, so that'll be a good job. So fingers crossed that we can get to the next 12 months. And there goes my phone and Michael will kill me. Thank you, <laughs> Keith. <laughs> Cheers, Lee. Fabulous. So good news all round. Yep, yeah, good news. We can carry on for another year now, hopefully. Good, good. I bet you'd feel sick in the pit of your stomach, wouldn't you, if, uh, if anything, if you had any negative feedback? Well, given that there was a farmer over in West Wales who uh, had a herd of uh, something over 500 animals and he was clear of TB and in one test they tested over 200 of them as reactors. So he went from hero to zero. I think they took the whole herd. Right. The shock of that sort of level of disaster and the fact that that can happen, yeah. that is always at the back of your mind. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, big relief. Now, we've Good. got some instructions there. Yes, yeah, more, di- more, more distractions. Uh, <laughs> I've scribbled our instructions down on the, on the back of the Sunday Telegraph, uh, actually, which is, which is quite nice, because I can, I can read through it then while, uh, while Michael's doing his uh, bits and bobs up on the table. But uh, Hev has asked us to talk about popular products, Phil, nonetheless. <laughs> so we need to drop this into the equation. I don't think we've, we've uh, done it at all subtly. <laughs> It's your but, normal uh, commercial a, a whole, self, for Yeah, that's right, yeah, so the whole stream of... Uh, the whole stream of it's an interesting thing, though, you know, has have, have, have listed uh, all the, the popular products to mention. But, you know, it's a funny thing, because I, I know it's, it would seem that I managed to, to create a reputation for myself as not being the, uh, the most proactive salesperson, but, <laughs> but yeah, actually discreet salesmanship is key in many respects yeah, but you, you know, have been accused at the past that your salesmanship <laughs> is so discreet as to be <laughs> indiscernible yeah no no exactly. but I, you know it's funny because I, I did a, uh, just a talk the other night at um, Selly Oak right, right in the middle of Birmingham people always come up to me at the end and I always think right I'll, I'll finish the talk and I'll get out of this room but it never happens anyway one woman came in and she said she was, she was wiggling through the, the Wiggly catalogue because they had a bunch of catalogues there from Wiggly Wigglers and she said I'd like to buy my sister a Bokashi bucket for Christmas. And she said, what do you think of those? Because, you know, what I'm, what I'm most conscious of, I mean, products, it's very important to be honest about the products. I mean, for me, um, I've, I've always, you know, as a, as a genuine person, I've always thought it's important to be honest about a product. So, if, you know, it's to, to tell the truth about things. And I talked about Bokashi and I said, yeah, I mean, I've used it. And I said, I've used Bokashi now for three or four years. She said, do you use it? I said, yeah, I do, yeah, I do use it. Mm. And she said, um, well, oh, it must be okay then. Mm. I said, yeah, absolutely is. And I thought to myself, well, actually, I do use it, and yeah, it is absolutely okay. I mean, there are elements of, of using it. That, uh, interestingly, some, someone came up to me a while ago and said, I've used it on my cashew bucket, I haven't been very successful with it. And I said, oh, okay, well, what, what sort of time length have you, you know, various questions, how long have you left your waste in your book, book actually? And the lady said, oh, well, it's been in there about six months now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I said, ah, there's you. <laughs> That's where you're going wrong. But that, that is really uh, the point, isn't it? The fact that all of us, all the Wiggly staff, use a proportion of the products and it, it gives us feedback on the things that yeah. need developing and i mean the worm cafe which has been something that is going very well the last month or so yeah is the updated can of worms and it's addressed the problems that we and our customers have identified yeah and so i gather that's going like hot cakes and the other thing that i've got to mention because it does look so good and and i know someone will be very pleased if i mention it is that we've changed the packaging because winning the uh, dell the More Business Award allows us to have a whizzy bang printer. It's allowed us to do mini brochures so that we can have different packaging, which even you might agree looks pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And it also has allowed us to do the kits and packs so that a product's grouped together right. and it's, it looks good right. and it does what it says on the box, yeah, I would say. Yeah, fantastic. So, yeah, what else is on the list, Rich? Uh, well, the other things that... Uh, oh, apparently I'm to ask you whether or not you're wearing your goat socks, Phil. Well, it's coming close, but I have to say that I don't use goat socks, not because I use anything out of preference, because I haven't bought any socks for working yeah. since we've had goat socks, but that's because right. the socks that I use are guaranteed indestructible. Right. However, this winter... Even my indestructible socks are reaching the end of their lives, right. so it will be goat socks for me. Okay, okay, so that'll be interesting. I mean, I have, seems to be rather passionate over goats. So in fact, everybody that had goat socks, even the most cynical of people that might think, mm, that's a bit pricey, have tried goat socks and think they're fabulous and live in them. Well, the proof is the pudding that up, up round Longtown, all these upland farmers 
they're a bit like you. They can be a little frugal <laughs> with the old pennies. <laughs> I'm but well, there's a bit. They yeah, all yeah, wear goat yeah. socks. But I mean, not uh, not looking wise. There's quite a lot of people with one eye in the middle of their forehead. And <laughs> that aside, they <laughs> all wear goat socks and swear by them. Right, so right. The, if they're good enough for them, you know, striding around the top of the black mountains chasing little woolly aphids. Yeah. Sorry, sheep's. <laughs> <laughs> then they're probably good enough for the rest of us, aren't they? Indeed they are. OK, well, I, I reckon, you know, we've pretty much covered everything in the, this week's episode of the Farmer Phil and Rovin Ricardo podcast. <laughs> so uh, I, I think it's almost certainly a bye-bye from both of us. And bye from me. 